record this. All right, so today we will be talking about the laws and principles of concrete mixture design. So this will be this this exam, exam two is more focused on how to actually proportion and, and batch and test the concrete. Um, maybe not so much batching, but the mix design and the testing part. So we'll go through quite a bit of different stuff. So today's, in a lot of ways, is one of my favorite lectures, is I can talk about food and concrete together. So how do you make good concrete? Well, I can tell you how you make bad concrete, or bad cookies, I should say, um, very, very similar. So with bad cookies, you know, like this picture, in the middle, it's all doughy and on the outside, it's really hard. Or as my mom would say, the outside's good for your teeth. Um, you know, it's like charcoal, so it just, you know, sharpens them up. Don't worry about it. Um, I, but, you know, my mom would make cookies like that. She wasn't so good, believe it or not. You might think, oh, Dan, you're a big guy. Nope, nope, nope. My wife, though, I married a woman that is an excellent cook. She makes cookies like that all the time. She made cookie, cookies for you last night. So they're all homemade. So we eat them because there's no preservatives in them or anything. But they're chocolate chip cookies. Um, and they're great. Um, but whenever you make cookies, some of the parameters that are in that, you got your ingredients. How good of quality ingredients are you going to get? You know, if it's a chocolate chip cookie, or you get the really, really cheap, you know, chocolate that's kind of just, you know, it's not really chocolate, but kind of tastes funny, or you're going to get the good stuff. There's actually three different types of chocolate chips in those cookies. So there's smaller ones and bigger ones, and there's some semi-sweet. And, and, and anyways, there's a lot of different, a lot of different stuff that goes into that. We talk about your recipe. Well, how are you going to actually? How much of each ingredient are you going to use? And then it's, well, how are you going to mix all those ingredients? How, when are you going to put them together? Uh, how are you going to mix it? Um, and then you know you have your prep of like in this case, the cooking time and temperature. So how are you going to actually lay out, you know, all those cookies on, on, on that cookie sheet? And then what temperature are you going to put them at? How long are you going to cook them for in that time? So they all play into that. So it's the same thing when we make concrete. Um, you have all your ingredients. Whenever you're putting it into the, the concrete truck, or if you're a central, central batch plant, uh, when you're putting into that, that, that drum, how all the ingredients, how much do you put in there? And it's literally the same thing. There's parameters that make concrete good, depending on how much the material is actually being, you know, what, what material are you gonna use? What proportions are you gonna proportion all those different materials together? And then, well, what batch process are you using? Are you using dry batch plant or are you using central batch plant? How long are you going to mix for? How far are you going to transport it? Um, and then the placing of that concrete. And then how, you know, and then the actual curing and sawing of that concrete all go into it. So the question is, is, is all concrete the same? Absolutely not. If you want a slip form paving application, uh, you know, I don't know why it cut off, but it's like almost like this projector should just be tilted up a little bit. But um, for slip form paving, so for highway applications, you may want a one inch slump concrete. However, for a bridge deck, you may want a five inch slump meaning this is really stiff and this is a lot more flowable and you're pumping with it. Um, 
Same thing with the wall. You may want something that's closer to a bridge deck or, or even more flowable so you don't get any more segregation. So you may want a six to an eight inch slump. So something even more flowable. Same thing with pre-stress. You want something that's, um, when you're making those beams, you want something that you don't even really have to vibrate it because it just self-consolidates itself. A footing, you can go somewhere in between a bridge deck and, 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 uh, and a pavement because you don't necessarily need it to be as, as flowable. Um, and then something like a footing. You may want something that's closer to a bridge deck or something, a floor slab, you may want something that's closer to a bridge deck so it can be placed um, on time. But at the end of the day, how do we get these numbers? So how do we go on our batch ticket when we get the concrete and we look at that batch ticket, how do we get those numbers? Well, the short answer is there's a lot of different ways to get those numbers. Um, you can do the ACI, which is the most academic method out there. Uh, ACI 211, I'm a committee member of. We're actually rewriting that document currently. It hasn't been, um, I think it was the last time it was written, it was back in 1990. Who was born after 1990? Anybody? Yeah, so like 1991, two, three. Yeah, so the document is older than you. It's supposed to be updated every like four years. A um, lot of history behind it, but, but in essence, there are a lot of good people that's been on that committee. Um, we've put out some good documents, but this one just needs to be updated and we're well, at least a year out at least. Um, but it's the most popular academic way of batching concrete. So you have to get taught that. Um, so I'll, I'll teach it to you. We'll have a whole, whole lesson over it and we'll actually go and batch it in lab. So you can actually design your mix and then go and actually out and test it. Um, you have the trial batch method, which is probably the most used method. It's where it, it really you iterate. So you might take a, take your materials and you might design it in one way, or you may already have a, a, a previous mix. You may have a really good 3000 PSI mix for a floor slab and you want to make it into more of a pumpable mix for a wall. And so you might just make some slight adjustments to get there. Um, and I'll talk about, we'll have a lecture where we talk about that a lot. So when you order the concrete, do you tell them that you want this certain, certain amount of stuff on it? Or what, what order of concrete before and you just tell me I need 3,500 pounds of 28 yards, right? Yeah, so we'll go over how to order concrete too. Okay. Another lecture, but yeah, no, you're right. Um, uh, according to ASTM C94, there's two different ways to order concrete. And so you provide specifications. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you provide specifications. You don't necessarily tell them usually uh, how to make the, uh, how to make the concrete normally. I mean, you can if you're, if you're the design engineer on the project, but not normally. Uh, normally you just give them specifications. And so we'll kind of go through how you get the specifications a little bit, um, the next couple lessons. And we will um, kind of, we'll, we'll go over how to order concrete properly. Um, and there's different processes depending on your project. If you have a really expensive project, you're gonna go through a mixed design submittal process um, where you know before the project even starts what that concrete is supposed to be. Um, and then there's another where it's just kind of like a a smaller project um, it might be like less than a week and so you may just have one day of actual real concrete work but where you're going to be pouring concrete um, and that can be ordered a little differently so um, and we'll go through some of that but these different mixed design methods the next one so we talked about the most academic, talked about probably the most used, which is you just kind of tweak it, iterate it, um, trial batch it um, in the lab to make sure that you meet those properties. 
The next one is the volume or the by weight method. So this is probably the most old school way of, of making concrete is the one, two, three, or three, two, one method, depending on who you're talking about, which is literally one shovel full of cement, two shovel fulls of sand, uh, three shovel fulls of rock. Mix it all together, add enough water, and we'll have a lab that kind of goes over that uh, actually next week. We also have where people kind of guesstimate where they may say, okay, we need 470 pounds or 500 pounds of cement. Um, we'll start off with that and then we'll try to shoot for 1800 pounds of rock and then we'll kind of make it all work uh, to get to get to one cubic yard with um, we'll just kind of just our, our sand. So they may try to target 1800 pounds for uh, rock, 1200 pounds for sand and then add enough water to get the strength and workability and, and, and depending on their admixtures, kind of balance everything out. And then there's the aggregate design method, which you can't see it down here. I don't know why, I don't know why uh, this thing doesn't go down any farther, but um, there's actually different aggregate design methods. So what I did my PhD on was uh, one of these methods called the tarantula curve. So it's used in um, over half the DOTs in the country or either implemented it or starting to. Uh, people in, in uh, Australia, South Africa, Europe are all using it. Um, so it's a cool little mix design method where you just design for your aggregates first and then you figure out how much paste you need. Um, so when we talk about aggregate proportioning in general, because it's the largest part of the proportioning process, you know, 60 to 80 percent is actually 90 um, percent is actually your 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 uh, aggregates. So people try to figure out how much aggregate you actually need to to put in to put in there, um, combined by gradation, some type of uh, voids can sometimes be used. Pretty much one, three, and five are all academic. Uh, two and one are probably the two most used and are the easiest to, to implement. Number three, that packing is ACI 211 tries to use, um, you know, you can call it one or, or three or four. Um, really, they try to use some voids to figure out how well things pack together. Um, but typically from what I've done, I've done a lot of mixing. Three, four, and five don't work. At least they don't work on their own. Um, there may be some type of mechanism that works really well for two and one, but they don't work very well for the other ones. So that's kind of what the tarantula curve looks like. Um, I won't go too much into it, but it kind of has a, it kind of looks like a tarantula curve. So when we talk about designing a concrete mix in general, whether whatever method you're going to use, the goal is when you're designing that mix is you're going to try to meet a law. So there's different laws that we have. Uh, we'll go over them, things like strength. <clears throat> workability, durability, service life. And so we try to meet these laws. Engineers, they come in and they actually design the mixes. They try to put, put specifications down so that in a way that you can actually meet those laws. And then you have principles. So principles are how to meet the specifications that are on the job site. So whenever you're designing that mix and you have the job site specifications, you're gonna use principles a lot of times to meet them. And you might say, okay, well, how's this work? So principles are really techniques like what are cement ratio, aggregate gradation, maybe using a fly ash, um, different types of cement. Job site specifications are, like I said, job site requirements. So they may say, hey, we need 3,000 PSI with this type of slump range. 
and we need 6% air for freestyle resistance. And so you have to go back and design a mix um, using your principles that you have. So looking at the water cement ratio, um, you may look at your gradation to see how to design it. And you may add in some air entrainment too. And you try to figure it out uh, using those different methods um, and the different principles and you design your mix. And then, like I said, the laws, these are kind of really what the owner wants to require. So they, you know, they may want the cost to be less than $100,000 on the entire project or, you know, um, for that mix. They may want 60 years of service life. They may want the concrete to be strong enough for the truck they're driving down the road. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of different, a lot of different laws that, um, that, you know, that the owner wants. So this is kind of like a preamble. So like the pre, the, the summary of mixed design with economical cost and sustainability in mind, concrete must obtain proper workability, strength and durability requirements, or the concrete's worthless. Just throw it away, you don't need it. You need to meet durability, strength, workability, and the cost, it can't be too, too much. And it's gotta be serviceable, you gotta be able to use it. So, the laws of mixed design, this is something I've come up with. Um, I've taught a lot of different mixed design stuff in the past and there's people get really confused and this is the best way I can kind of explain it. Um, is really there's, there's five big laws. You have strength, workability, economical costs, durability and sustainability. So I actually played football up at NEO in Miami, Oklahoma. So we're the Norsemen, so they're, they're Swedes. So it's kind of like the Swedes, but you only get, you don't have that extra either. So if you're Swedish, that helps out too. So when we talk about specifications, so laws, uh, when we talk about specifications, these specifications are used again to meet the laws. <clears throat> So a design engineer on a project which is typically going to have some basic laws. Um, they're going to come up with, they're going to use ACI 309, 318, ASTM C94. So 301 is the standard specifications of concrete. ACI 318 is the standard specifications for structural concrete. ASTM C94 is the standard specifications for ready mix concrete. So first one is general specifications for concrete. Middle one's largely for structural stuff. So um, elevated slabs, pre-stressed beams, things that are probably not on, on the ground, okay? Floor slabs, um, pavements outside, a lot of times those aren't actually structural, they're more um, functional. And there's other committees that, that have standards on, on that, but I won't get into that right now. And then ASTM C94 is really for a lot of concrete producers. So what's required for that mixture design and we'll actually go through that. So when we talk specifications, there's four different common types. Probably the two most that you'll see is either have a performance specification, meaning I want the concrete to behave this way. And so the design engineer is going to say certain things, 3000 PSI, 5% air. Um, they may have prescriptive principles, prescriptive specifications, which is maybe something like um, this is exactly how you're going to make the concrete and they may get extremely detailed in their process. 
So everybody, for material specifications, we've been going over this. So you should be pretty familiar with this table. And so when we talk different principles to meet those laws, these are some basic principles. Water cement, the paste volume, paste quality, your air entrainment, setting time can, can be a principle. Um, hot and cold weather concrete, um, how, how those adjustments are made in hot cold weather concrete, um, aggregate gradation. So there's a lot of different little principles and we'll, we'll go through that uh, when we're applying it in our mixes. So, so let's talk about these five different laws. So we have the law of strength. So concrete's paid off of strength normally. What's my compressor strength? Um, so concrete producer may not get paid until those cylinders, they're broken and, and they look good. So this is, a, this is a curve I put together um, through a lot of experiences I've had with cement uh, or different concrete and cements and stuff. And I've noticed that 1, 3, and 7, and 28 days when you break, break concrete at those times, 28 is what you get paid at normally. So 100% F prime C is 28. So about a third, 33, 35, 45% is at three days. Normally 50 to 80% is at seven. And then 100% of the 28 day strength is going to be um, there. So that's kind of the rules of thumb. These are just Dr. Dan's rules of thumb, Dr. Cook's rules of thumb. Um, and it's important to realize this is, you know, for normal 28 day strengths. So you might say, why do you break cylinders at seven days or 28s? Is that, you know, whenever concrete actually gains its strength all the way? Well, you know, you make concrete one day, then a then, you know, a week later you come back and you test it or four weeks later you come back and test it. And 28 is not, not too bad of a number. I mean, people can't wait any more than usually, you know, a month, four weeks to um, really see how good that concrete's looking. But it does, I mean, it does flatten off quite a bit for strength gain um, after 28 days. But um, you may see 100, at 56, you may see 120%, or 90 days, you may see 120%, but they flatten off pretty well. You may see at 10 years, you may see double your 28 day number. So um, I feel like that's a pretty pretty good number to, to base things off of for your strength. Um, you can also base for law of strength if you need something high early. So you need high strengths at an early age, um, like one day or 14 hours or, or, or something like that, three days maybe. Those are called high early strengths. And so they change these numbers quite a bit, um, depending on what you're doing. And then you have high strength concrete. So it's kind of like ultimate high strength. So you may look at 28 days or 56 or even 90 days to get really strong concrete. So usually when you say high strength, ultimate high strength, you're talking about over 8,000 PSI concrete. Um, so when you go to design concrete uh, for strength, say you're at a 3,000 PSI minimum, well, you're gonna design above 3,000 PSI because concrete, if you take 100 cylinders and you break them, I don't think I have, yeah, I don't have it. You go and you take 100 concrete cylinders and you break all of them. Theoretically, it should go into some type of normal distribution like you see here. So how much of those cylinders do you want to be under 3000 PSI? Well, you get paid off of not having low breaks, you know? So you, you really want as, as many as you can not to be above 3000 PSI. Unfortunately, you're gonna have, you know, even if you make it designed at 10,000 PSI, 
um, you know, eventually you'll have a low break that's that's all the way out there statistically. Um, so there's some statistics that we'll talk about next time about how to design a concrete mix, but you always design it well above 3,000. It may be 3,800, maybe 3,600, depending on how your distribution is. Sometimes people, um, it may even be 4,000 or 4,200, you may try to design that. But there's always a safety factor so that most of your concrete's gonna be well above that 3,000 or whatever your design strength is. And again, this thing should be melted in your brains by now, but um, the, the cement, the fly ash, the slag, whatever your cementitious materials are, when they start reacting with water they and they start doing your strength gain, that has a huge deal um, with with how you know with how your strengths are going to behave over time, so how well that cement's ground up, what your water cement ratio is, what the chemical uh, composition of your cement is, what type of cement is it, those all play into to your compressive strength over time. They can also play with your design, making sure you get the right strengths at the right time. So just kind of be aware of that. If you want your, you know, your rocket to shoot up at a high early strength, you're going to have to do stuff. You have to use certain principles to get your compressor strengths up higher, quicker. Um, you're going to have to use things like accelerators or type three cement, lower your water cement ratio, stuff like that. And you have to use, you know, maybe a water reducer. And you need to realize. When you use accelerators or retarders, they're going to have effect on your strength. So the green line here is no, no admixture. But what I noticed whenever I added um, an accelerator, well, you got you know you got higher strengths at an earlier age, but after really after three days, they kind of flattened out. That seven day, twenty eight, they just really flattened. The retarder though, you had lower strengths initially, but after seven days, it really kicked off. And by 28, you actually had higher strengths than the other two mixes. Um, so just kind of be aware whenever you're focused on setting times, because um, it's too cold or it's too hot. And so using accelerator or retarder, um, there, are, there are effects to that. So let's talk about the workability now. So law of workability is the ability to place, consolidate, and finish the concrete. So you need to be able to have good concrete. You don't want concrete that segregates. That's actually a job I was uh, finishing concrete on. You don't want that. You don't want when you order the concrete, this was a six inch slump that we ordered. It came out at a zero. <laughs> it just, you know, it was very stiff. You also don't want, we have really poor uh, finish. So if you have a lot of manufactured sand, we have little BBs in it, and you finish off the concrete, and those little BBs pop up. Um, you really don't want, you really don't want that. So you need to make sure your gradation is good too. Make sure you have the right paste. Both of these. Both these pictures are caused because you have bad gradations. So would you have to like get rid of all that and order a new slump or something if that happens? A lot of times you reject it. It just depends on what you're doing because you, you know, um, sometimes you can make it work. Sometimes they'll take the, we'll take the come along, um, which is kind of like a rake, but that doesn't have any holes in it. So it's kind of like just like a piece of metal and they'll pull that concrete up and they'll pull the paste in with a rock and remix it. That's not good quality, you know, product, but that's, sometimes that's what they'll do. Or they'll just keep finishing it because that's what they have because it's already placed. Um, and they'll just, you know, now you can take pictures and say, this is what we got um, for liability reasons. And they can come back and um, later and we can figure that mess out. But, you could, and that's actually, that's actually what we did. They trimmed out uh, over 60 gallons of water 
in this truck. When we added that back in, it got to the slump that we needed. However, they didn't tell us um, that. And we said, is there, you know, we're pouring, we need a six inch slump today. Is it ready? And whenever they, they said, oh yeah, it looks great. Well, came down the chute and we're like, well, you're not ready. Um, so they had to add water and it slowed up what we're doing. And we needed to, we needed to be really fast paced on um, when we were pouring this. So kind of messed up what we were doing. That's a good question though. You, you, a lot of times you can add water as long as it doesn't uh, surpass your maximum water cement ratio. You add water and it surpasses that maximum water cement ratio, then um, you, as a, if you're a contractor, then um, you know if you don't meet strengths, then that's on you. Um, tear it out and replace it. So that's because a lot of you know when they put the rag, they cut them, and then later on when they're gonna pour it, they add more water to it. They can, yeah. And and again, as long as because a lot of ready mix producers, what they do is they say, okay, look, I'm not gonna take this truck to the job um, with all the water added because if, if you do that, you're gonna exceed the water cement ratio, or maybe I don't know exactly the workability you want, so I'm gonna trim out a little bit of water. So I may not add all the water to the, to the concrete. Um, and, that, and that's, you know, that's not a bad philosophy. You just need to communicate that to people. And a lot of times they just don't. They don't say anything. And so one of the problems in, in the, especially with concrete construction is there's just not, the communication is very bad. So um, communicating, you know, what you're doing, because every ready mix operation is different. You know, and, and every concrete uh, contractor is different. And so whenever I'm going out and pouring concrete, I want that concrete to be a six inch slump. When it goes to the job site, you know, you know, for this one application, you know, maybe this other one, I need a two inch slump. But whatever it is, I need that. I don't want. I don't want to wait around while you mix your truck up. You know, time's money, in my opinion. I'm paying these guys to go out there and finish concrete and place that concrete. I need it now. I don't need to wait for your truck. Is your truck's gonna back up? Then another truck's gonna back up. Then another truck's gonna back up. I need this now, and I communicate that. We talk about ordering concrete. And I've seen that where they start backing them up, and it's like I think it's like an hour, two hours, they start setting them back. Yeah, and that and that depends on what's going on, and you actually have 90 minutes, and then you have to reject that concrete. So there's a lot of problems, and and so I'll talk about um, pre meetings and how important pre pour meetings are. Um, but again, um, kind of getting back to it, when we talk about different applications, depends on your workability. You know, how well, how well you want it to flow? How do you want the surface to mix? These floor slabs are a huge deal uh, with the finishability or decorative concrete. So you may want more sand in these mixes than you do some of these other mixes. Um, or you want way more, more, more paste, more paste volume, I should say at least. Uh, but they may not have the high strengths that, um, you know, that like a pre-stress beam would have or um, sometimes with, with walls. So, you know, just kind of be, be careful. You may, you know, this may be 3,000. This is usually 4,000 in Oklahoma. Um, you know, so you have different strengths. I've seen some floor slabs lately, especially the Amazon facilities. They're at, you know, five, 6,000 PSI. Um, when we're talking about consolidating or uh, communicating the workability, how we do that is through slump right now. So how well, and really we communicate how well it flows measuring slump. So we measured slump in the lab. Um, and so that's what a zero inch slump, uh, cones 12 inches. So, you know, when we start getting 10 inch slump or greater, your cone, you really need to, they, they actually invert the cone and they'll do a slump, uh, slump flow is what they call it. And they'll actually measure the diameter of it. 
So, and we'll go through that, but that's whenever you're dealing with SCC concrete. Um, so, but you know, this is basic flow. So kind of this battle, like we were just discussing, why'd you add all this water on the job site? Well, there's some people that don't know how to order concrete. Some people don't know what they're doing. There's other people I've had ready mix producers I bought concrete from. They looked at me square in the eyes and they go, hey, we made some concrete. It's cracked. Yeah, it's discolored. It doesn't meet any of your specifications you have for the project. But Dan, it's good concrete. I go, no, that's literally the definition of bad concrete. And I don't want that. Take it out. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's two different people, you know, that are kind of battling. And so we try to have ACI certifications for finishers so we don't have that as many problems. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't have certifications. Now we do. Um, one of the committees I'm on, 302, uh, construction of floor slabs, we focus a lot on that. And so, um, and so that really helps out. There are stuff with producers too, where they can kind of, um, we can kind of realize some of that. Also in the mixed design submittal process, we can kind of realize some of the, the problems too, through testing and stuff. So uh, just kind of be aware. So again, workability, aggregate plays a huge deal in that. The next law is cost. I think we all pretty much figure out cost. You have your mixed design requirements and how much money you're going to pay for for that concrete. So there's always a balance there. So sometimes you can use fly ash. You can make your concrete a little cheaper. You know, you can shave off a little bit of money. Um, you know, that that's a difference between profit and no profit. And so that fly ash can give you a little bit better workability maybe. And you can uh, save a little bit on your cement. So by replacing it. So that's kind of what we did there. Cement was 564. We took, we added some uh, fly ash. We took out some cement. Um, so now let's talk about durability. So usually in Oklahoma, concrete durability issues. Uh, we've seen some a little bit in Arkansas. There's a lot in Texas, for sure some in Kansas City with ASR. Uh, sulfates in the Oklahoma, Texas panhandle do happen. Um, you have corrosion on bridge decks in Oklahoma. Bridge decks all over the country have corrosion problems. Uh, there are a lot of rebar in it and they're elevated slab and they're exposed in all directions to uh, environments. So moisture gets in and it corrodes at rust. Uh, freeze thaw, so anywhere, you know, moisture gets into the concrete and it freezes, you're going to have freeze thaw durability issues. So, you know, there's different ways we design for this. So that's what, like I see seeing pictures of, the freeze thaw issues, cracking and scaling. We can run testing on the mixture to make sure it's freeze thaw. So we go through freezing and thawing cycles back and forth. Um, and we can see how well it performs. We've talked about the mechanism behind it and how the water goes in there. Um, another free thaw durability issues with the aggregates, which we've talked about already. Um, it makes this kind of this V cracking pattern. Um, and it's an issue with the aggregate. Whenever that aggregate, the, the pores that are in that aggregates, um, the water that goes in there and it freezes and then thaws. Same mechanism as, uh, as you know, free thaw durability in concrete. So some aren't very, very good and they'll cause cracking. Corrosion, like I talked about, if you have the surface like a, and then the moisture goes through there, there's a crack on the surface, goes straight to the rebar. That rebar might actually start uh, rusting and corroding and that causes cracking. And then it may spall off. You can you get, get exposed to your rebar. And so eventually that will rust enough where your rebar will um, fail and it won't hold load anymore. So you have to replace it. You have sulfates in your soil. They react with the C3A and your cement. They'll react together um, and it'll cause cracking. So you can use a type two, you can do some testing 
make sure that doesn't happen. Um, with ASR, alkalized silica reaction, so the alkalis that are in your, your cement, the silica that's in your sand or your rock will react. So this is a Jersey barrier in, I believe, Fayetteville, Fort Smith, Arkansas area that had some ASR cracking. It's one of the few in the state of Arkansas. But a little ASR gel comes out of it. Um, when the alkalis and the silica react, that needs water. And so there's gel that comes out of those cracks. That's how you know, it's a big reason why you know it's ASR if you can see it. Um, so they, so ACI 318, I believe 301 either has or is going to have uh, a standard on this eventually, but you can actually go through and design for uh, the law of durability. So a lot of design engineers for a project will communicate to you, hey, this is maybe, you know, the air that you need. This is the amount of cement and flash and stuff that you need to look at. Um, and so they'll actually go through this process a lot of times for you. Um, if you're not, you know, if you're the design engineer for the project, that's making the blueprints. Um, so they'll tell you a minimum strength, they'll tell you a maximum water cement ratio, they usually tell you an air content and then a minimum cement content too or cementitious. The last one is serviceability. This is probably the hardest one. Sometimes people even put sustainability in with this. You know, your goal is you want the concrete to last as long as possible. You know, you want a dam to last 100 years. In buildings, a lot of times, you know, 99 plus is what they're insured for. Uh, you know, depending on the right building for concrete. But, you know, bridge decks usually about 30 years because of corrosion. Pavements can be 30 to 50 years. Um, some DOTs are wanting even more, but that's kind of the five, the five different laws um, and the different behaviors around it. And a lot of the principles of um, focus on the water cement ratio, which we've talked about. Amount of water to cement that's actually in, that's in your mix. Um, and then this kind of goes over, you know, how much water do you have in your rock? We designed for, like I said, SSD. And so terms like design, free, um, free water, batch water, trim water, we'll kind of talk about um, coming up. So um, with that, those are the kind of the things we'll talk about. So next time we'll go into specifications. Is there any questions before we go? If you want your cookie, eat your cookie you know, somebody's next to you, hey, have at it. Um, you know, it's their fault for not showing up. Um, but our exam, the average was an 85, uh, which is which is about right, it's about where the homeworks were and stuff. So nobody flunked it. So have a great weekend.